Settle down, class. Thank you so much. Today is the third in a series of lectures on the software patents in Europe. Hi, David. Hi, Mom. So, Bill Gates, he gets like an invitation from the Vatican saying, we want to make you an honorary cardinal. And he's really, he's really pleased and he flies in his jet all the way to Rome and comes in to see the, the Pope. And the Pope is there, ah, Mr. B, Mr. Gates, Mr. Gates, come in, come in. So Bill is really happy, you know, he's like, finally, I'm recognized. And the Pope is like, ah, oh, Windows has been so good for the church, so good for the church. We want to give you this award, Windows, yeah. So Bill is like, so what are you using? Are you using uh, XP or Yanto Vista? No, no, no. We don't use Windows. We use Linux, you know, Ubuntu. Ah, very nice. So Bill's kind of confused. He's like, so why am I here? And the Pope is like, well, I explain, you know, the Catholic Church, we sell paradise, we sell redemption. But people, they don't believe in heaven unless they know there's a real hell out there. <laughs> yeah. And this is the year, you know, Everyone keeps saying it was going to be 2000, big breakthrough. 2001, the year on the desktop. 2005, six, seven. This year, Windows is going to succeed on the desktop. It's true, finally. Anyway, this talk is about software patents, not Microsoft. And I'm going to first of all explain where we are in Europe. Then I'll explain a little bit the conflicts that we see in a broader sense. I'll take a specific example, which is the NoXML and OXML fight at ISO, which is related to software patents. And I'll talk about open standards a little bit more generally. And then I'll explain the patent system in a kind of uh, broader sense, so you understand where that's coming from. And then something new, which we'll, bring, we'll take in at the end. So software patents in Europe are actually not allowed. If you ask the EPO or ask the commission, they'll say, we do not allow patents on software. This has been their policy for the last, I don't know how long. They only allow patents on things which software does, which is, of course, the same. And this is the fact facing European software developers and companies using software, making software, is that if you go to the patent office and try and get a patent on software, they will refuse. But if you're a lawyer who's good at this, you'll get one. Um, and it's really the lawyers against the engineers in this case. Now, there was a big battle in 2005, a directive which was basically kicked out through the work of many, many people. It was the biggest, the most lobbied directive ever in Parliament. And it was the, the moment that I got involved in this discussion, because I'm a programmer. I mean, what do I care about patents? The situation in Europe hasn't really changed a lot since then. The European Patent Office, which is outside the EU, grants software patents by the thousands. You want one, you get one. There's a slight inefficiency in actually applying them to the market, i.e you know, suing people is not as good as it could be. And so there is a move to create a big central European court which would enforce software patents for once and for all. And this happened in America about 15 years ago. And they made a court called the Court of Appeals of the Federal Circuit, CAFC. And CAFC basically said, if you can program it, you can patent it. Anything you can patent, we will defend. And they were really, really pro-patent court, which has turned software into the number one litigation area in America. This is what is planned for Europe. So obviously, it's a bad thing. And this, this plan was called EPLA. Now, EPLA is actually dead, we've been told. The European Patent Litigation Agreement. There is, however, a son of EPLA called EU EPLA, which is still alive. And this is really about who in Europe controls the patent system is it run by this EPO outside the EU? Is it run from Brussels? Is the court in Luxembourg? Is it Munich? A lot of fussing and fighting over money and power, but no one really questioning this ideology that software patents are a great thing for innovation, which of course is insane to anyone in the room here. Unless someone here from the EPO, but I don't think so. So Europe's situation is that there is still a large political push to put into place a good, solid software patent regime, like we have in America. Of course, in America, it's also kind of falling apart. So there's a, a good 
interest in delaying the process as long as we can. So we get the American example to disprove the European theory, political theory. Okay. You will have noticed that the, um, that the European, the EU countries signed the Lisbon Treaty recently, which is a constitution, basically. And the Lisbon Treaty gives new powers to the Commission and Council. And this is also part of the push to get patent system installed. It gives the, the Council the right to sign treaties. And there is a danger that the EU will try to join the European Patent Convention, become a signatory body of that. Okay, this gets very political. Don't worry about the details. The meat of the matter is that there are people like FFII working on this. And if you like politics and if you like to get into really complex, arcane issues of whether this article in Lisbon Treaty allows or excludes the right of the European Commission to join, when a, to come, and, come and speak to us. It really bores me to tears. So what I like is a good fight. People in my association know this. Um, a nice discussion on free BSD and conflict resolution. Well, when we look at the political process, what we look for and what we are really interested by are conflicts. The way we work as a, I think, uh, political hackers, what we look for are conflicts which are in place, which happen, which evolve, and then we try to exploit those. And the theory is quite simple. If you're in a world where there's a change, and as we are looking at a, a big change from industrial to digital, then conflicts emerge. And those conflicts, big, slow, sometimes very, very aggressive, they can be infiltrated, they can be understood, they can be hacked, and they can be turned into useful, constructive processes. So I'll explain a few of the big conflicts that we have going on right now in Europe with respect to the patent system. Well, the first conflict is between the EU and the EPO. It's a very big, very bitter conflict over money and power. Basically, the European Patent Office was set up before the European community had any kind of a strength as a temporary place to put patents. Like, we'll keep them there for a few years, just in case. Of course, this temporary place became very powerful, got money, got you know, its, own, its own purpose, began to lobby for its own existence. And by the time the EU got any kind of a strength, EPO was a permanent institution defining laws which affected the EU. Now, of course, the European bodies, the Commission, for example, they really hate that. So the Commission is out to get the EPO in any way they can. That's very useful. That's a very good, useful conflict which we, we try to get involved in and try to use. Another conflict which we see is the conflict between patents and standards, especially open standards. This is also an emerging conflict. There's a kind of um, ideology in, in Commission that all standards are patented because what they see are the big telecom standards. They see standards produced by Siemens and Philips and Nokia, and they're all patented up to the hilt. What they don't see are the Internet standards because they're basically invisible to people like the Commission. And yet these are becoming much, much more important than the proprietary patented standards. I liked the example of email versus GSM. GSM is a very widespread standard, patented, but email is much, much more important globally. The number of people, number of businesses built on email, the number of layers that are built on top of that far exceed anything built on GSM. And it shows that a really open standard is a much more powerful tool for economic growth than the patented standard. So there's a, an emerging conflict between the patent system's ideology of, you know, we promote innovation and we, you know, give a reward for investment and the reality, the reality of the, of the economy developing on open standards. And so we're seeing for the first time a politicization of the debate around open standards, which is quite new. We're seeing people actually lobbying very hard to get the government, the European governments to define open as being open and patented. So that when then they choose open standards, they will also choose open and patented standards, which is of course meaningless. There's a conflict, a very big conflict in America, less in Europe, between the IT industries and the pharmaceutical industries over patents. Now, in America, patents are much more litigious. They cause many more lawsuits than in Europe still because of the central court. And if you look at all the lawsuits on patents, there's a nice site called Troll Tracker, which lo looks at patent lawsuits. The top lawsuits, they're always on software. And software is, the software industry in America is being sued to death, basically. 
And that's really annoying them. I mean, you know, constant, persistent lawsuits from trolls on, on, on stupid patents which are granted and enforced. And so the, the IT industry goes to Washington and tries to lobby for a better patent law, and they face this very strong, very professional opposition from the pharma industry, who do not want any kind of a weakening of the patent system. For them, it's a, a holy, you know, it's like Serbia and Kosovo. And, and Kosovo is, you know, software, and Serbia is the pharma industry. And so there's this attempt to break free in America, which is failing. The, the IT industry cannot lobby. They're idiots. They go into the lift, and they're arguing amongst themselves over, you know, what, what does open mean and free software, and they're fighting, and they go towards the, the congressman, and they're still arguing about some, some, some random stuff. And the pharma guys are there with their briefcases and their money and their lawyers, and they just wipe out the IT industry. But this is an emerging fight between IT and pharma. And we also like to look at this and try to exploit it in some way. Anything which weakens the patent system is very useful. And then, I guess free software and open source has really moved up. When, when I began in this discussion three, four years ago, when you talk to a politician about the importance of free software, they didn't believe you. There was, there was like, ah, you're hackers, you're a minority, you're a niche, you're not relevant. And we'd say, no, no, free software is a really important economic, economically valuable technology. It's a way of producing much more value. It creates jobs, it creates businesses, it creates everything you like, everything which is good for you. And the politicians would be like, ugh, I don't believe you, literally. Well, today that's no longer the case. Today, if you go to the commission, talk about open source and free software, they understand what it means. And the reason is very simple. Big companies have moved their infrastructure wholesale onto free software open source. Really, um, my clients are, for example, big banks, and their whole backend infrastructure runs on Linux, Apache, free software, open source. It's fast, it's cheap, it's reliable, it's better, everything. And the importance of free software as an enabling technology for Europe's, Europe's economy is becoming very, very important. So when you can say patents break that, that's now a very strong argument, which wasn't there a few years ago. So these are the conflicts that we look at, that we try to exploit and, and, and bring up. So our general theory of conflict is that conflict produces new structures. And we try to be there and help the instructors evolve. When, I'll give you an example of one particular fight that we've been in. So FFII, okay, Association of Volunteers Around Europe, and we work on many domains, and we've been working in Brussels for the last, uh, I guess, year, more or less, on Microsoft's attempt to standardize its OXML format. It's a very interesting example for many reasons. It shows, first of all, who is not aware of this, of this, of this process? Who is, who is here ignorant of the ISO and Microsoft and OXML? Hands up. Okay, so your neighbors explain because there's like three of you in the room. Um, next week, we're going to Geneva to actually watch this ballot resolution meeting. Microsoft has decided that they want their standards to be open and ISO, international. And the reason is that they are being, I guess, they see the, the wave coming wiped out by governments who want open standards in their purchasing, in their own systems. When they buy, they want to have a choice and they want open standards. So like the, the Dutch, you know, give the Dutch a clap because they have now voted in government overwhelmingly to, you know, endorse open standards, use ODF, free software, open source as, as a platform of their, of their infrastructure. And Microsoft are really scared by that. So they want to be able to say, yeah, well, ODF is open standards, well, so is OXML. Now, ODF is ISO, so is OXML. You know, play that game. And uh, they're losing this game, which is very nice. The campaign that we started, so basically, this guy here, Benjamin Orient, who's one of the unsung heroes of this revolution, he began a website called No XML, which began to, it has a petition and began to spread the, you know, the simple logic that why this push for the standard was a bogus push. I think we have like 82,000 signatories on the petition um, from all across the world. And it's serving as a hub of a community which involves companies, um, open, open office activists, standards activists, intellectuals, developers across the whole world who share information and who are convincing national bodies to not let this thing go through. This thing being Microsoft's proprietary format that they want to declare ISO. And the development of the, the NoXML campaign 
is something I'll come back to later on in this discussion. It's a very interesting um, model for building a community which is politically aware and can actually execute some kind of a constructive action. Now Microsoft is being faced by a commoditization of their infrastructure. And open standards are the key to that. It used to be that governments didn't really worry whether their documents were in uh, format A, format B. They worried about the cost of the software. They worried about the versions of the software. And it's become now, you know, it's hitting governments. Well, if I accept a format that's owned by a company, I have to pay them more money. So just from the dollar side, I want choice at that point. So Microsoft is trying to get not just OXML, but the series of their standards, there's about five or six coming up, push through ISO to get the ISO label and say we are a de facto, we are not de facto, we are a de jure, a legal international standard, you can use us safely. And so a lot of our work is to deconstruct this argument and show why it's a bogus argument. Because it sounds plausible, governments don't think very much, they take usually easy choices. So one of our projects has been to set up a new organization called Digital Standards Organization, Digistan. And you can look at the website, but the Wi-Fi is kind of poor here, but you can try, digistan.org. And the goal is to actually explain and promote what a real open standard is once and for all. And you'll find many definitions on the internet of open standard. Open standards are standards with reference implementations, with blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I made a, a simple and short canonical theoretical explanation of this based on the theory that standards are about capturing, capturing markets. The reason why people, companies invest in standards is because they're good for business. A little company like mine will invest in standards because we see a market growing that we can sell services to. So we see standards as the tool for making markets. Very nice. Companies like well, Philips and Siemens and Nokia in the, in the past and Microsoft see standards as ways of capturing markets. So a good example would be the Blu-ray HD DV, DVD fight. It's about who owns the future of movies on, on disc, who gets the licensing royalties from that market, who owns the market. So the motivation for larger businesses is to own capture markets. And you can basically then turn that around and say, well, an open standard is one that actually resists being captured. It's a bit like free software, it resists being captured. If a standard is designed properly, if the process is designed properly, that it can actually resist being captured by vendors all the way up its, its chain, then it can be open. It's that simple. So now if you look at something like ODF, you'll see in fact it's slightly captive. You'll see that there are a few companies which have a lot of influence in its design, which is a problem. ODF is not perfect. It's owned by some people who don't give enough access to the process, but we can improve that. You look at OXML, it's completely captive. It's owned by one company. No one here in this room can submit changes to OXML. No one can fork it. No one can, you know, improve it. Only one company can. Therefore, it's 100% captive and therefore it's 0% open. And the fact that it's published means nothing at all. That's a precondition for open, it's not a sufficient condition. So looking at the concept of vendor capture, vendor capture, is a powerful tool for deconstructing a lot of the propaganda around open standards. And when you're talking about open standards to people and explaining why they're important and why governments should you know, choose open standards, think in terms of, and speak in terms of vendor capture. It's a very, a very powerful um, tool which cuts away a lot of the bullshit that we hear. Um, the bullshit is amazing, it's, it's endless. It's like, for example, yes, but choice is good. So Microsoft, have a, they have a pro-choice campaign. Pro-choice, we want two standards. You know, let us choose more standards. Let's have three standards, let's have four standards. It's good for choice, which is it's completely bogus. Yeah. So we do the same with the patent system as well. We deconstruct the patent system language. Um, the patent system is, is, is very, it's actually very old. And the arguments around it are also very old. I remember reading an article which was discussing the debate in 1830, 1840. And it's just the same debate as today. It's very funny. Um, Switzerland was called a pirate nation in 1830 because they had no patent system. And because they just 
you know, they copied the French dye manufacturing industry and, and they didn't pay their royalties and they were pirates. And this word pirate comes, you know, it's 150 years old. And the patent system actually dates from a, 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 a time when economy was a kind of religious thing. You know, this is before Adam Smith. And it's a bit like creationism. You know, it's the, we, we think something and we will then tell you with great force why this is true, but we don't actually analyze or use any kind of scientific approach. Patents emerge from the brains of people who do not understand economics. And patents are anti-capitalist, they're anti-free market, and they're actually a protectionist device. And in the, 18, in the 19th century, there was this big fight between the patent system and free trade economists. And the patent system was abolished in many countries in Europe. And then there was a depression in Europe and it was brought back in, along with trade barriers and protectionism. So when, when, when you hear the patent system being talked about as a tool for innovation, it's a tool for protectionism. It's the same kind of innovation that gave the Russians shoe factories which produced crap shoes. The same innovation that you know, gave the political theory where you, you close your borders to promote your own businesses. It doesn't work, it's complete failure. Now, protectionism does not create innovation. Innovation comes from competition, free market, this is Adam Smith's basic theory. It seems to be accurate. So one of the games we play is to turn around the patent system's language on itself. So for example, the patent system talks about invention and inventor, which is great fun. And we promote invention, we promote inventors. And they have these inventors days where they, you know, inventor of the year. So in, we say, well, an inventor is a patent agent. And an invention is a patent. That's it. An invention is not actually a working device like the little You've got to see this, it's so cute. This charger here. That's, that's not an invention. That's just a product, right? An invention is a bit of paper that says you can't sell that product. That's what a patent is. Patent says, no, I own the right to sell a wind-up charger in green. That's my idea. I own it. I bought it from the patent system. Hey, that's an invention. And an inventor is a guy who writes bits of papers. He's a patent lawyer, patent attorney. He's not an engineer. And innovation is not actually making new products. Innovation is making new kinds of patents. This is very important. So, you know, you have like a copycat would be a, a company which makes new products and doesn't bother to patent them. It's insulting. When you listen to patent system rhetoric, when you speak to patent experts, you can also use these, these deconstructive techniques on them and it just it messes with their minds. You know, it's great fun. And it, it, it's the way it does. Inventions are patents, not products. So, in Europe today, what we're seeing is the emergence of these different conflicts I talked about. So we have open standards becoming more and more important. We have free software, open source becoming more and more important, becoming politically important, not just in our, you know, for us, this was obvious in, in 91, 90. It's now obvious to mainstream. We see people actually accepting that little companies in Europe don't need patents. Wow, this is mind-boggling. It just goes against all the ideology, but it's actually the way it is. So what's the next step? You know, where do we go as a community? How do we now you know, make something happen? What do we do? This is very difficult because we don't actually have a clear fight today that we can go and engage in. This is also why we're, we're working on the OXML standard issue because there's no directive in parliament right now. There's no law we can go out and lobby against and you know, demonstrate against. And activists like us, we need some kind of a friction to work against. I have a question here. Why do, we need, why do we need something to protest against? Why can't we propose our own ideas ourselves? Thank you for that question. So we're going to propose something ourselves. Indeed. The, the, the bet is that these conflicts will become severe enough that 
within about a year, 18 months, there will be a push for a new directive in Parliament. That's what we think. Just looking at the, the way it evolves, there are already some moves in Parliament to clarify some aspects of the patent system. There are some discussions about maybe software is, you know, a special case. Maybe it needs its own kind of patent system, which of course is in itself bogus as an argument, but as a, a way of breaking the patent system's integrity is a very nice argument. And so what we're going to do today is launch a new campaign. Actually, we're going to do it right now. Thank you. And Benjamin will launch it. Is it not working? <laughs> Come on, the demo can't fail. The Wi-Fi is working. So you go on to... Yeah. Never do a pat. Ne never do a demo on the same day. It's a live demo, okay, guys and girls. So, disaster. Anyway, we're using a tool for our campaigning called Wikidot, which is a really fantastic tool. And I'm CEO of the company. It's a new open source product. Um, we use this in all of our campaigns, and it basically lets us launch new websites in a in a few hours. Petitions, forums, the whole lot. Um, we just made this website now, I think. I think he cheated, actually, to be honest. It looks a bit too quick. This is going to be called Kill Software Patents. Because we want something strong and emotional. And we want an enemy. The enemy is software patents. We want to kill them. And basically, I put a few issues here. It's a, I mean, they're a bogus economic thing. They're just, they're just a fraud, basically. We, we can see that. We can prove it, almost. They're bad for SMEs. Europe is more than America, more than China, is, is, in, is, a, is a continent of little companies because of our diversity, because we are, you know, lots and lots of countries with different languages, we have lots of markets. Europe is particularly dependent on little companies. Little companies need open standards to collaborate, and they're vulnerable to patents. So more than America, the argument that patents are bad for SMEs is relevant to Europe. And you'll see that patents, open standards, SMEs, it goes together. If I, as a small company, want to develop a product, I have to work onto a standard. I can't begin to develop products in, 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 you know, just in space. We make standards-based products. Standards cannot be patented. We use GPL. We cannot pay royalties. We cannot accept any licensing conditions. And Microsoft's attempt, you know, Microsoft is facing the free market. It's really quite funny. On Slashdot, I read a discussion about the Microsoft publishing its, its specifications and making a promise not to sue. And uh, the, the typical slash dot comment, someone says, yeah, but this is capitalism, you know, monopoly is part of capitalism. And someone says, no, it's not. And in fact, monopoly is part of capitalism. That's fine. The free market will eat monopolies alive. SMEs will actually destroy monopolies given the free market. And so what Microsoft does so hard is to try to destroy the free market. It tries to say, no, there's not really competition. And it's not actually working. In the long run, the success of free software open source proves that Microsoft cannot hold that monopoly. And its last, its last retreat is software patents. It's its final last retreat. Everything else that it does, making really complex specifications, keeping them secret, trying to capture the desktop, trying to leverage monopoly, all that can be broken by an aggressive free market. But patents can't be broken. So Microsoft's last ditch stand is to patent its standards, publish them, and then to say, if you want to use these standards, you've got to play to our rules. And those rules exclude free software. They exclude GPL. They exclude commercial competition. So they want to create a slave economy based on their standards and say, yeah, but they're open, they're published. And it's no coincidence that Microsoft is one of the strongest lobbyists in Europe for software patents because they see Europe as their testing ground. Europe is aggressively against Microsoft's monopoly. And America has been captured a long time ago. There's no resistance there. And Europe is fighting back. So Microsoft is lobbying so hard for software patents here. And this is why we do this. So did you make this right now? It's fantastic. Just pretend he made it, OK? There's no login.
This is my laptop. Benjamin's going to talk for five minutes here. Benjamin. Okay. Um, I wanted to add a word on 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 the situation um, regarding the central uh, the creation of a central court. Uh, basically, the the big issue we have in Europe is that we created what is called the European Union in the 70s, and at the same moment, the patent uh, people wanted to create a European patent. And we have two systems basically right now which are competing against each other. And the, the question right now for uh, decision makers is whether, whether you will uh, scrap the old system or you will make a compromise. And the old system is called the European uh, Patent Organization. So you have on one side the uh, European Union system with the Commission, the Parliament and the Council of Ministers. And uh, on the other side, you have the European Patent Organization with the um, uh, controlling body, which is called the e European Patent Organization, and the executive, which is called the European Patent Office. And uh, the big question right now in the discussion on committee patents is whether the European Union will accede to this international treaty called the European Patent Convention, which regulates this European Patent Organization. So um, let's, say, let's say you want to, um, you want to make, uh, to, you want to, to know who is deciding in the system in, in the case of, uh, uh, in the case of the European Union, it's quite sim simple, it's, it's two bodies, it's the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament. So when you want to change a law in Europe, you have to address, you have to convince those two bodies and and then you can have a law or if they decide so. In, in the discussion right now in, the, in, Euro, in Europe, in the, in especially in the Council of Ministers, you have um, a proposal which uh, proposed to get the 27 member states, European Union, to sign this international treaty for um, delivering patents in Europe. Um, one of the issue is this uh, proposal to sign uh, this treaty is the governance. Um, so as I explained, when you ha want to change the law uh, in Europe, you address, you convince those two bodies, the, the uh, European Parliament and the Council of Ministers, to, uh, to make the law. Now, if the EU sign the European Patent Convention, where you have uh, six more members than the 27 member states um, as, mem as signatory of the treaty, then to know who is deciding is a little bit tricky. Um, so you have these six countries which are outside of, of the EU, uh, Turkey, Iceland, uh, Norway, uh, Croatia, uh, and uh, other countries which are part of the European Patent Convention. And um, what you will have is the Commission sitting, uh, sitting at the administrative uh, body who administrate the European Patent Service. So um, the key issue is whether the European Parliament, which represents citizens, will have a say in the system in the future. Um, basically, if you go to the, the page of the European, uh, uh, the Administrative Council of the European Patent Office, you will see that the people who are governing the system for patents in Europe are uh, national patent offices. So basically, you have a, a, a conflict between, let's say, the executive, the, the institution that deliver patents, and the legislative, the people who decide about the law. And so basically the people who grant patents uh, on the national level decide also about the law. And that's, that was one of the key issues in the Software Patent Directive is that in the Council of Ministers, um, the people who were deciding for the position of the ministers were the national patent offices. So if the EU managed uh, um, one, uh, soon to get to be part of this international convention, the role of the European Parliament won't be uh, as powerful as it could be if the system would be integrated in the European Union. So, um, and, and the European Parliament was the only body in the whole system uh, against the Commission and the Council who, who was uh, um, accountable to the people in order to reject uh, the bad law. 
And uh, um, if the, in the future you have to change the system, it is important that it's not in the hands of technocrats. It should be in the hands of people you can fire with elections. People who are sitting in the, in the administrative council of the EPO and in the, in the working group on patents in the council are not elected. They don't have any names and they are anonymous diplomats. So that's, that's something you have to take, take in mind, even if we have a central court in Europe, which will probably happen, even if this court decides uh, this, this uh, convention about the exclusion of computer programs, we interpret it the same way the EPO interprets it. It's important that the, the governance of the whole system is made in the hands of uh, people who are elected and, and, and not in the hands of, the, of, of technocrats. And I think, I think that's, a, that's one of the key messages we have to put in the minds of, of, of politicians, of decision makers in, 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 in a close future. So, I wrote a text this morning, okay, I cheated, but the site I made just now. So you can see it, killsoftwarepatents.com, if you're on your Wi-Fi, you can look at it. And the model that we will do, this is the model that we did for no XML campaign. There's a petition, which we'll make with a number of, oh my God, the font got large again. Oh, this is, someone's playing with the Mac. There'll be a petition, which, we will collect supporters, basically. Uh, we did this in 2002, I guess. The Euro Linux petition, we had half a million supporters. That's a bit old now, so a new petition in EU. We'll do one in America as well. Possibly one in Brazil and China, India, I don't know. We'll start some mailing lists, public mailing lists. Anyone can join, discuss what's going on. Wow, this phone's going to get so large here. <laughs> Basically, what I'm asking for are people to join this, this campaign now. So if you're interested in working with us, then please join the mailing list now. There's one mailing list set up already. And together we'll discuss and write the petition text. We'll look for support from activist groups around Europe. There are many, many groups not just FFII, but also April or FUL. Do you want to speak or are you going to join the petition? Okay. I'll just, I'll just conclude and then I'll have time for questions, okay? And the goal of this campaign is to raise, one more time, awareness of the issue to politicians to show that there is a, a popular demand for a change, that we're not happy with the way things are and that we're actually, we actually want a clear change. A change is a ban of patents on software globally. And probably as a, as a conclusion would be in Europe a new directive on patents. As Benjamin said, it's in the parliament that things actually happen, not in the commission, not in the diplomatic conferences. So thank you very much. I'll now take questions. I think we have about a quarter of an hour for questions. Thank you. Thanks. So thank you. Uh, I want to join this initiative, but uh, I want to bring a, a, a very a new information from Germany. I started a campaign. It's called 10, um, 10 million uh, euros because um, the government of Nordrhein-Westphalia will has uh, has uh, announced to give uh, 10, 10 million euros to. Microsoft for license fees for the um, computers of the governmental um, um, staff. Right. So the problem I see, and this is a, this is a point, we need uh, support from you also to get this public, because we are only uh, three or four, five people who started this. Uh, we started it from the um, German Schole Linux team, mm -hmm. this team who is working for free software for schools, and. Um, our problem is um, we, see, we see a connection between this uh, decision from the government and the climate change. 
And, and this is because they get license for Vista, but the computers they have will not run with Vista. Right. So they had to buy new hardware, or they had, they had to buy more license fee to, to, get, to, down, to be able to downgrade. Right. And um, we see with the new Vista, we see a, 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 a big ecological problem right. because the new hardware will consume more electric power and uh, we, that's that's the reason why we start this so campaign, and I I uh, hope to get help from you. Okay. It's the the mailing list is ten, um, hoch, seven. I don't know in English. Um, at schoolerlinux.de. Okay. So, uh, but I will join so it and will write it in English here okay. on your we, mailing we're list. We are also, too. for example, thank in you. contact. Uh, you'll have seen in Holland that there is. Uh, oh, thank you. There is a, a strong movement in, 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 in many parts of Europe to push governments to adopt uh, free software open source as part of their procurement. And this is a simple matter of tax dollars. Um, you, it's an easier argument than climate change, I would say, is that it's, it's a waste of money to pay for licenses when you can get things for free. It's a very simple argument. There are other arguments, such as allowing um, SMEs to compete fairly for government uh, contracts. So what, um, what we can do is try to bring together um, different groups in Europe who have the same problem. We have a very active community in Spain which is convincing the Spanish government region by region to adopt Linux, adopt open standards. We have this happening in Holland. And it's easier when you can share your experience across Europe. It makes it much, much easier the arguments you can reuse. So our um, standard answer is to look for people who have the same problem, build a kind of a common platform. We can help you make that. We can give you help in making websites, mailing lists, whatever you like and find the people and bring together. So you um, find Benjamin after the, after the speech and give him your email address and we'll talk. Okay, any other questions? Over here. Yes, I have a question about the interaction between uh, patents and standards. Yes. Currently a lot of standards organizations allow some patents in their standards under RAN terms, reasonable and non-discriminatory. Um, can't we convince the standards organizations to change the definition of uh, RAND, because if your main competitor is free software, then a license fee is hardly non-discriminatory. Right. So what happened with standards bodies like, for example, IETF W3C, was that they began with a fairly naive assumption that patents didn't exist and that all standards were open. And as major vendors, large companies, got involved in the process, they began to push in the concept that they somehow owned parts of the standard and they would license them. And you've seen a kind of this is my view anyway, a kind of a corruption of the major standards bodies by the, the, this dogma from, from large companies. And you're now in the point where, for example, the W3C will actually endorse a standard which includes patents. And it's completely hostile to free software. It's completely contradictory to the, the ability to, to relicense your work and give it for any use. And I'll just finish. And the answer to this, our answer to this is to say, um, it's actually two, twofold. First of all is to explain why it's bad and talk about vendor capture and say the standard if it's capture, captive it's useless and we won't use it, we won't endorse it, we will, we will actually reject it and the second answer is to build an alternative model for standards development which if you, if you look at the W3C, uh, ISO, they are fairly um, captive. They're, they're in many ways they're dead I would say. ITF in many ways is dead. It's a hostile thing to say, but it's almost true. So one of the things we're looking at is to actually build a new standards framework over time to develop standards, and they will be very clearly open, and this is why, and so on. Okay, thank you. Uh, given the um, amount of software patents, for example, in the United States, do you think it's possible to create a standard that is not patented? That's a very good question. My company is involved in the standard development, AMQP. We spent about three years on this now and a lot of money and time. And it's true that there's a big risk that someone somewhere has a patent on this standard. And we can't tell. In fact, the answer is most likely any activity which has any commercial value in software will provoke a patent to emerge. Anything. So any activity which has money involved, somebody will have a patent which can apply to that. That's kind of the, the rule. At some point, it'll, the patent will emerge. Um, there are businesses that actively look at and they're proud of it. They look at areas where there is activity and they look for things to patent. 
It's a business model. And the problem isn't the patent troll. The problem is the law which makes us a good business model to follow. And last time uh, there was a, a campaign against software patents. Uh, there was also an alliance for small and medium businesses. Yes. I believe it, it was called a uh, Linux alliance. This is still exist. And um, is it cooperating right. with the FF okay. against software patents? So there are many alliances of small medium businesses. There are many regional alliances. There are many um, European organizations that represent SMEs. Uh, what there has not been was a formal representation for SMEs in the IT sector at the European level. And actually, FII started such an association last year called ESOMA, the European Software Market Association. And the goal of this association was to bring in not just free software, but all businesses which depend on a free market in, in software, which is producing or consuming, and to bring them in as um, active participants in the debate, because it must come in a large part from business. When you talk to politicians, you can't just talk about you know, personal ideals. It, comes, it must have an economic basis. And the answer is, there are many associations. I think we've made one more. Uh, I don't think there's a conflict there. I think that we, we will see lots of this uh, organization happening. Um, it is very important, yes. Um, yeah. So um, recently on the Belgian television, they had a show um, for, um, uh, well, actually, uh, for inventors, so where they invite inventors uh, and, uh, from, the, uh, from the general public and they uh, are supposed to send in inventions and they make a whole show of it. Uh, don't you fear that um, with this, uh, this kind of show, the general public will take uh, patents for granted and yes. probably also apply this to software? Yes, yes. Re and this is, this is part of the patent marketing propaganda. It's a very old, a very old marketing propaganda. It's more than 150 years old. Is to say, we promote invention. Inventors are honest, hard-working individuals. Look, an inventor, this man, he invented something. It's fantastic. Give the man a prize. Give the man an award. And yes, um, and of course we're all inventors. Yeah, this is our job. We invent day and night. We're creative people, all of us. But we don't bother going getting a patent for it. And if you look at the, it's a very strong argument to say we promote inventors. It's a very strong counter argument to say inventors are actually patent agents. Look at who actually owns patents. They're not the, not the inventors. There are some and they're exceptional. And that exception proves the general rule. Patents are Inventors are patenters, inventions are patents. And you can say this, when you, if you go to an invention day with the patent office sponsoring your universities to whatever, try and get a speaking slot, try and get up there and speak and say, look, all I see you know, is the sale of patents. And when, I, when you say inventor, I see a patent agent. When you say invention, I see a patent. And it'll make them slightly uncomfortable. And, and that's how we stop this kind of argument. But the public is not very sophisticated, huh? Up here. Is this on? Yeah, I guess it is. Uh, this may be a stupid question, but obviously many things are broken about the patent system, and this is all about how it affects us software people. Right. Could, um, could the patent system as a whole be made better if it only applied to, say, investments? So if you don't invest in something, you cannot be violating a patent. If you look at this website that I made today called Kill Software Patents, it's not the one that's being shown here. Benjamin is just reading his email. Um, <laughs> you look at Kill Software Patents and you'll find that near the bottom there's a link to an article I wrote called In Defense of Software Patents. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, not a real defense, it's a, fo a false defense. And you'll find all of the arguments for patents in general, for software patents, and I break them all one by one. There are most of them old arguments. And in fact, the argument that you should reward investment is a very classic argument. It's bogus. It's completely bogus. Everybody here who writes software invests. Uh, none of us expect to be rewarded by getting monopolies. We get, we get rewarded by making better products that get us customers and that pay us. And if you allow the, the patent system to reward investment, then you come into a game, and this is the answer to your question, is the answer is that no, you can't improve it. You come into a game where companies will prove investment to get patents, and suddenly 
If you're a big company, oh, here you spent 100 million. That gives you 100 million worth of patents. Oh, okay, sorry. You're talking about fixing the patent system, right? Yes. yes. Sorry. The question was not, uh, could we improve the patent system by making patents apply to investments as opposed to inventions? Right. My question was, could the patent system by f be fixed by deciding that if you're not making a significant investment in something, then the use you make of technology there cannot possibly be a violation of a patent. In other words, that you will be immune from patent litigation because you're not investing. And, yeah. and the answer is that you can show investment trivially. Anyone, any company can bring up paper and say, I invested. Um, Though here, here you would want to prove that right. you're not investing because that would make you immune from the patent litigation. A company not investing in that may not be sued. I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. Okay. If the patent system, and maybe it's stupid, but if the patent system works such that if you are not investing in use of some technology, then your use of that technology cannot possibly be a patent violation that is not relevant to the patent system as a whole, then whoever does not invest in using technology would be free to do so. When you say invest, what do you mean? If I write a program that uses something, am I investing or not? I don't think so. Not if I pay it. someone to write a program, am I investing or not? That's up to, that would be up to a judge, so, of course, and they I mean, routinely deal, deal with that sort of issue. Clearly, if I don't make, if I don't make a, a free a V over IP implementation, I can't be sued for VIP litigation. I mean, if I'm not using a patent in my business, I won't be sued. So the patent is an instrument for giving a business exclusive privilege in a market. That's all it is, really. It's a grant from the government to a person saying, you own that market, it's yours. Yeah, do what you like, 20 years. And the market, there's people in that market, so if people who are not in the market won't be sued. Does that answer your question? If you're not in the market, you won't be sued. Okay. I hear you uh, attacking the concept of patent in general rather than the concept of software patent uh, specifically. Um, sure. If we are to, if our goal is really to uh, kill software patents, don't you have a bigger chance in explaining why software is different, why the fact that we uh, built upon previous uh, layers far more than any other uh, uh, area where, invest, where um, research is done, uh, makes us far more vulnerable to uh, the patent system than other areas? Sure. I mean, this is, this is like saying guns are bad and, and guns with children are particularly bad, okay? The software patents is what we are concerned about. It's our business, it's what we see. And FFII has always been quite careful about not attacking the whole patent system. And I remember when we, I, I've been accused of being anti-patent, as if being anti-patent was a crime. And what I think today, in fact, is that when we don't question the rest of the patent system, we're actually in reinforcing it. That's what I think today. So by saying, oh, software is special, software is different, software needs its own system, and for the rest, for pharmaceuticals, for business methods, go and you know, do what you like. It actually, I think, makes our case weaker. And I'm convinced that the software is an extreme case of the patent system gone crazy, yes? That's where it goes really bad. Software is a really important part of the economy, but so is pharmaceutics, so is health. So is uh, you know, green energy, so is uh, a, a lot of domains which are really heavily hit by the patent system. Why are there no drugs for malaria? The reason is that it's all patented. If you research malaria, you are being sued for patent infringement by somebody. If you research malaria, you're in patent infringement. So although I'm a programmer, I'm also a human being, and I also care about the whole world, if you like. I'm not limited to one thing. And I also see that a lot of the arguments that help us fight the software patent problem are general arguments against the patent system. So I have no problem with that. The patent system for me is a completely bogus construction which can be tolerated in many industries. Because many industries, like if you look at steel or car making, there are no small companies anymore, right? There only are big companies and they have all their deals worked out. It's, you know, it's, it's gone past 20 years. All the patent trolls have come and gone. But in the software, we all see it still. However, the patent system has this 
malign influence on European politics, for example, on American politics too. We have this EPO sitting outside the EU and still coming to Brussels to lobby, to pass its laws. So the patent system as a whole, I'm happy attacking it. Yes, I'm happy attacking it. I'm happy saying the whole thing is unethical. The whole thing is uneconomical. The whole thing is a, a bogus ideology based on old, old protectionist economy theory, which is, doesn't work. And in software, it's particularly bad for these and these reasons. Okay. Okay, well, we've reached the end of this session now. Um, thank you all for listening in silence, unlike the questions in the previous thank session. Um, and uh, we resume at uh, 2 o'clock in here and in about 15 other rooms. <laughs>